जय राधा राधा कुंज विहारी So we're beginning the tenth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. This is entitled "The Abs the Opulence of the Absolute." In text number one. Mm -hmm. 
श्री भगवाच पूर्य महाबाहो शृणु मे परम वच यथे हम प्रिय अम यथे हम प्रिय मनायाया श्रीभगवाच भूय महाबाहो शृणु मे परम पच यथे हम प्रिय वक्षयामि हि थम्यया श्रीभगवाच भूय महाबाहो शृणु मे परम पच यथे हम प्रिय वक्ष्यामीतकया Shri Bhagavan Ubacha The Supreme Personality of Godhead said Buya again Eva certainly Mahabaho O mighty armed Srinu just here may my paramam supreme vachaha instruction yat that which te to you aham i priyamanaya thinking you dear to me vakshyami say hitakam yaya for your benefit translation the supreme personality of god had said listen again Listen again O mighty armed Arjun because you are my dear friend for your benefit I shall speak to you further giving knowledge that is better than what I have already explained please repeat the supreme personality of god had said the supreme personality of god said listen again O mighty armed Arjun listen again O mighty armed Arjun because you are my dear friend because you are my dear friend for your benefit I shall speak to you further. I shall speak to you further. 
giving knowledge that is better than what I have already explained. Purport, the word Bhagavan is explained thus by Parasaramuni. One who is full in six opulence, who has full strength, full fame, wealth, knowledge, beauty, and renunciation is Bhagavan, or the Supreme Personality of Godhead. While Krishna was present on this earth, he displayed all six opulences. Therefore, great sages like Parasaramuni have all accepted Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Now Krishna is instructing Arjuna in more confidential knowledge of his opulences and his work. Previously, beginning with the seventh chapter, the Lord has already explained his different energies and how they are acting. Now in this chapter, he explains his specific opulences to Arjuna. In the previous chapter, he has clearly explained his different energies to establish devotion in firm conviction. Again, in this chapter, he tells Arjuna about his manifestations and various opulences. The more one hears about the Supreme God, the more one becomes fixed in devotional service. One should always hear about the Lord in the association of devotees. That will enhance one's devotional service. Discourses in the society of devotee can take place only among those who are really anxious to be in Krishna consciousness. Others cannot take part in such discourses. The Lord clearly tells Arjuna that because Arjuna is very dear to him, for this benefit such discourses are taking place. <clears throat> Om Agyan. Timidandasya genajana salakaya chaksu unvelitam yena tasmai shri gurave namaha nama om vishnu padaya krishna pristaya bhutale shri makti bhakti vedanta swami tinamine namaste saraswati deve gaudavani pacharine nirvishesa sunyavadi pasyatya deisatarine Panchakopa Turuvischa Kripa Sindhu Bevacha Ditanam Pavanevyo Vaishnavevyo Namaho Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Dvaita Gadad Har Shiva Sadi Ho Ur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hila Prabhupada ki jai. So Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati in one <clears throat> periodical he wrote that those who say they have no time for hearing or chanting about the Lord This, this is this uh, this statement is karma buddhi, and it's like a bad smell coming from the body. Therefore, they never get the mercy of the spiritual master. <laughs> we have so much service, but we th we don't have no time for hearing and chanting about Krishna. We're doing our service, but. We squeeze in our rounds and then the rest of the day we do other things. But the process here is, as Prabhupada says, the more you hear about Krishna, he calls him the Supreme God, the more you become fixed in devotional service. Shravanam, Kirtanam, Smarnam, these three are connected in line. From hearing, when hearing becomes intensified, or one, one as you used to use a cliche, when one becomes packed up in hearing, the tendency to, is to want to speak about what you hear. And from speaking, or kirtanam, remembrance becomes strong. <laughs> and the process is really about remembering Krishna. <laughs> That's the process. So these three, it begins with hearing and expands it into speaking and then ultimately 
remembrance. Those who, who hear but don't speak, they remember something. But those who speak about what they remember, hear, they remember a lot more. The percentage increases quite drastically. So this is the process. We want to get attracted to Krishna. We are attracted to Krishna in some, some form, but the attraction is always something that is increasing. It should be more and more and more. And then Prabhupada goes here. He says, Discourses in the society of devotee can take place only among those who are really anxious to be in Krishna conscious. We can be in Krishna conscious in a very casual way, in a routine way, in a way that, well, you know, if I time, I have time for Krishna, I have time for this, I have time for that, a little bit here, a little bit there. And we put Krishna amongst all of our activities. He becomes one of the many activities in our life. But it has to be foremost in order to become Krishna conscious. So here it says that those who are really anxious to become Krishna conscious, they can, they are eager to take part in discussions about Krishna. So this uh, Bodhiantas Parasparam, and this, this is the verse coming up in this chapter. Bodhiantas Parasparam, Katiantas Jamam Nicham Tushyanticha Ramanticha. Tushanti means satisfaction and Ramanti means happiness. So those who take part in discuss, discussing the glories of the Lord, they are very satisfied spiritually and they're also very happy. Ramanti means not only happy but real happiness, intense happiness. So this is where the process of devotional service expands. So we can read, and that is hearing, and we have so many books to read from, Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, uh, but spe specifically Srimad Bhagavatam and Chaitanya Charitamrita, where we get to the pastimes of the Lord, the activities of the Lord, how the Lord deals with his devotees, how he shows his mercy to all living entities accordingly in different ways. In other words, getting to know the Lord the Lord has a specific way of do, do, doing things, and he's a person. Just like each person has their own character, their personality, their ways of dealing, so Krishna also. But his is supreme, his is perfect, and to, get, and to hear more about him means to learn about that person. And as you learn about him, you learn how to uh, satisfy him, and you also learn how to develop your love for him because it's natural. And so this process of hearing must go on regularly. And 20, actually 24-7, we should be trying to somehow or other connect with the process of hearing. Now the process of hearing can come with reading is hearing, and hearing from outside sources, such as what we're doing now, is also hearing. Hearing from recorded lectures, which is one of the features of modern development of society. We have so much media, and there is so unlimited uh, material on the internet and other, other media sources where we can plug into some really pure transcendental subject matters spoken by devotees who are qualified to speak. So we have so much. But the tendency of the conditioned soul is to see success and by how much we get done mm -hmm. on the external level. In other words, I did this and this happened, therefore this is good. And that's nice. But getting done is also part of Krishna consciousness. But purifying the heart comes fast and more direct when we hear and chant the glories of the Lord. And that is getting done. What is that getting done? You're getting rid of the material coverings. We're cutting through the maya. And we're getting right to the source of our existence, our relationship with Krishna. And Krishna's pastimes are so sweet 
that the, once we develop, develop a regular hearing, we get attracted to those pastimes. Once that attraction develops, then a sweet taste starts to come. When that sweet taste starts to come, then we want to hear more and more, and we become eager to hear more and more. That eagerness is the feature of success in Krishna consciousness. Like that. So Krishna's pastimes or activities, it says that in Dwarka, they're sweet. In Mathura, they're sweeter. In Vrindavan, they are the sweetest. <laughs> Sweet is used in all three definitions, but the intensification of the sweetness comes when hearing about Krishna in Vrindavan, his pastimes, with his parents, with the gopis, with the cowherd boys, with his other associates in Sri Vrindavan Dham. And this is what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came to give us, <laughs> Krishna in Vrindavan, and what Srila Prabhupada has made very clearly in his books that this is the goal, is to come to that point where we find our uh, enthusiasm directed to hearing Krishna's Vrindavan pastimes. And the more we do, the more we become purified. And as we become purified, what happens is you get knowledge and you get happiness. Happiness is already part of our nature, but it's covered. So purification simply means cutting through the coverings, that's all. As you cut through the coverings, just like as you, if you are in your room and the sun is out and you have the shade on the window down, the sun cannot be seen. You can see some light coming through, but you can't see the sun. As you slowly move the shade up, more and more light comes. The light's always there. It's nothing, you're not bringing in the light, you're simply getting rid of the coverings over the light. And then the light becomes full. In the same way, our happiness is already in within us completely. And cutting through the coverings means hearing about Krishna and revealing that happiness, which is, you know, anandam bhuti vardhanam, as Lord Chaitanya says. It's an unlimited ocean. So Prabhupada used to very strongly speak to us. He said, I'm writing so many books, but you're not reading. You're distributing my books, and that is nice, but when people ask you what's in the books, you say, well, our, our teacher, he writes and we distribute, that's all. <laughs> so we have to also read. He said, these books are for the devotees. That's what he said. And I'm writing them for my devotees, my disciples. So we have a lot there. And so one should make a regular part of the day, one hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. And even if you can come together as a group, just like in some ashrams, they have a, big, a regular group discussion. They bring the devotees in, and then they, somebody reads, and then they discuss like that. And then a discussion based on what is reading, and then it becomes interesting. And so much is revealed, because each devotee has, sees and hears these pastimes in a slightly different way. Sometimes, and then in that hearing and in that slight difference, one gets different levels of understanding, which is correct. So everyone has the correct understanding, but everyone brings their correctness in from a different angle of vision. So it's all correct. It's like if you're looking at a mountain, if you're standing on one side, say you're standing on the left side of the mountain, or the west side of the mountain, you see what's on the mountain on the west side. If you're standing on the east, that's what you see. If you're standing on the north, that's what you In other words, what angle of vision you're looking at the mountain is correct to you. But no one can see the whole mountain because our position is in, a, in, a, in, in relationship to the mountain very small. So we can see something about, or you know, understand something about Krishna's pastimes. So as we discuss it, Amongst the devotees, we bring out more and more understanding of what is there in front of us that we can't see in our own. So that's why Krishna will say in the ninth, in the, no, I'm sorry, the ninth verse of this chapter, 
Bodhiantas parasparam katiantas chamam nityantu shanti cha or manti cha. This is the this is the nectar that devotees have to hear and chant the glories of the Lord. And as as it says here, Krishna is even eager, he's eager. He sees Arjun, how Arjun has assimilated all the knowledge that Krishna has given him so far. And he refers to the previous chapter as the most confidential knowledge. But now he says, I will even give you more about my opulences. And then you'll see, starting with the 14th verse in this chapter, Krishna starts to describe his opulences in relationship to the material energy. And it's interesting how he compares himself to the best of all material things in different categories. And as he does that, you can also see the glories of the Lord in relationship to the material energy. Because as, is, as it's understand, uh, understood, um, everything is Krishna. <laughs> there's nothing outside of Krishna. There's Krishna and then there's Krishna's energy. And everything is, everything is included in those two categories. And there's nothing outside of those. There's Krishna, there is the sun, and there's the sunshine. So there is Krishna and his energy. We are part of his energy. And Krishna is Krishna. And everything else is also a part of his many energies. So when you understand that the absolute truth means everything, there's nothing separate from the... Uh, therefore, Prabhupada was explaining, I was just listening a couple of days ago, and every, even, even the slightest little thing in creation, you can connect it to Krishna. He gave the example of a piece of furniture. So what is, it, what is a piece of furniture? It's, a, it's actually coming from wood. Wood comes from trees. Trees are part of the material energy. What makes a tree is that a seed comes and then the seed is planted in the earth. So the earth is created by God. The seed is created by man to bring out the tree. And the seed is also the ingredients that makes up what Krishna has already given us. So you put it all together and you get, you know, a table. <laughs> so that you can trace that table all the way back to its beginning. And this, it's all coming from Krishna. <laughs> the ingredients that make up the actual formulation of the table is all, all supplied by the Supreme Lord. So therefore, everything is either him or his energies. So now Krishna, well, he says, because you're my dear friend. So Krishna likes to please his devotees. And when he sees his devotees are eager to hear about him, Prabhupada said, not many people are interested in Krishna. Not many. But if someone is interested in Krishna, then Krishna will help them to understand more. So showing our interest in Krishna means to become eager to hear and chant his glories more and more. Then he says, oh, this person's interested in me. Here's some more. And so we get so much knowledge simply by our desire like that. The struggle that the devotees go into, everything I'm saying, I'm sure you all agree with, but then you think, well, I have so much service. There's the deities, there's the cooking, there's the, there's the managing, there is the managing of the managers, there's everything. <laughs> and then there's always something new every day in, in the service, right? So what is, then hearing and chanting gets kept pushed away a little bit, more and more. And then uh, if we get a chance to hear and chant, we consider, oh wow, that's good, I got some time. <laughs> But we should uh, balance ourselves that we get a sufficient amount of hearing and chanting. It's like, it's like food. And food, there's different types of food that you, re, that you require in order to give the overall health of the body. But if you eat only one type of food, you may find yourself being deprived of certain nutrients or certain benefits that are, that are available. 
So we have to balance our Krishna consciousness where we have enough time for hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. So it's important like that. So I'm happy to see the devotees come to the classes and that's a good, good sign that there is an eagerness for hearing and chanting. Um, sometimes devotees think, well, who's giving class? Oh, it's that guy. All right, well, actually, I, I got something else to do. <laughs> but you can always learn something from anybody who gives the class. When a person is giving, there's always something there that's beneficial. If you take one thing away from a discussion, you can, that might be considered to be successful or beneficial. So there's always benefit in hearing. And even if we can't really recognize any benefits, the, pra the, pra the fact that we practice hearing is a benefit itself. Because the art of hearing is also something that what needs to be developed. When we're hearing, we filter what we hear, or we're not always hearing constantly. Our minds wander to some other subject matters. We're thinking, well, well, class, I'm glad class is over by 8 o'clock. And then I can, there's prashadam after that. Now, hurry up, Maharaj, get to the end, so we'll get to the best, better part. <laughs> so, there, you know, we're, <laughs> we're always, <laughs> we're kind of like, you know, we're, not, we're here, but we're not always here. <laughs> they say you are where your mind is. Mm -hmm. Prabhupada tells the story how... Um, Two guys, they're on their way to the prostitute. They're walking together, and then they pass a kirtan party on the way. And, uh, you know, um, uh, Marco's leading kirtan, and uh, Anant is there dancing. So. <laughs> so there's a kirtan party going on. And one of them says, oh, there's the devotees, the Hare Krishnas. I think I'll go to the kirtan. And the other one says, no, nah, no, nah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't I want to go. To, I'm going to the prostitute. You go to the kirtan. So. so he's on his way to the prostitute, and the guy who goes to the kirtan, he, he, he goes, he joins the kirtan. So while the guy's in the kirtan, he's thinking, boy, hmm, boy, my friend went to the prostitute, and he's enjoying like crazy. <laughs> and... And the other guy who's in the prostitute, he's thinking, boy, my, my friend, he's more intelligent. He knows how to use his time. Here I am wasting my time with the prostitute. So who's better off? So Prabhupada said, you are where your mind is. Like that, so. Oh, this is an example. So um, when we... Can, the mind is restless. Chanchala himana krishna pramati balabhadrita. It's always moving this way and that way. But if we concentrate ourselves on hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord, one of the techniques I use when I first begin reading, I go very, very slowly through the words and I very carefully try to understand what is being said. And as we pick up the, the mood of what is being said, then the meanings start to come to the surface. You can start to understand more and more like that. So uh, very carefully concentrate on the process of reading or even when you're listening. Sometimes we're listening to some lecture, but we're doing something else and we're not completely into the sound vibration. But the more we become connected to transcendental sound vibration, whether it's reading or hearing, the more that sound vibration reveals not only what is being said, but what is not being said. And that means you understand even things in relationship to what's being said. You get realizations through the concentrated form of hearing. And there's where Krishna consciousness becomes sweet and becomes more and more continuous like that. So we have to practice. And so Krishna, for the next so many verses, up until the 13th verse, he'll talk about himself. And then in the 14th verse, he starts to speak about himself in relationship to the material energy. 
This is a very, very interesting chapter. It's the chapter where the the actual essence of the whole Bhagavad Gita is explained in four verses in this chapter. Okay, so uh, let me see if there's anything else we can say on this particular verse. And uh, the very beginning where Parasar Muni is quoted that Bhagavan refers to that person who we know people who are strong, we know people who are famous, we know people who are wealthy, we know people who are knowledgeable, there are people who are beautiful, and there are people, people who are renounced. But nobody has these qualities completely in full, only Krishna. And so everyone has a speck or a spark of some or one or, one or more of these qualities. But Krishna is the reservoir of all these things. So we're attracted. People are attracted to wealthy people, to beautiful people, to strong people, to famous people. But that person who has all of that in one is Krishna. So therefore, if you have attraction for these opulences and you find them in people in the material world, you should know that, that whatever they have is simply a spark of the source. That's all, a small spark. Krishna is the reservoir of all these acts. That's why he's called Bhagavan, the reservoir of all opulence. Okay. So any comments or questions related to this particular section? Hare Krishna, there is a question online. Um, Srinath Bhagatam 4, 1930, the person quoted, Lord, Lord Brahma addresses them thus, My dear sacrificial performers, you cannot kill Indra, the king of heaven. It is not your duty. You should know that Indra is as good as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. You should know that all these demigods are but parts and parcels of Indra, the king of heaven. So how to understand here that the devas are parts and parcels of Indra? Hmm. That's a verse, 419? 41930. Uh, and could you read it again a little slower? Mm -hmm. The verse? Yeah, because I didn't catch the whole Sorry. Um, Lord Brahma addressed them thus, My dear sacrificial performers, you cannot kill Indra, the king of heaven. It is not your duty. You should know that Indra is as good as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. You should know that all these demigods are but parts and parcels of Indra, the king of heaven. Oh, that's, that's the story of Prithu Maharaj. And what's happening there is Indra had stolen the sacrificial horse from Maharaj Prithu during the Asvamedha Yagya. And so they wanted to retaliate against Indra. And so how are the demigods parts and parcels of Indra? Um, Indra is a post. It's not just a person. Um, every Manvantara, there are a different personality who takes up the role of Indra. The Indra in our present Manvantara, his name is Purandara. That's his particular name. And he is the present Indra. Indra is empowered by the Supreme Lord to manage the affairs of the material energy. And his demigods are his angas, or limbs, assistants. And so each of the, many of the demigods, not all of them, carry out a specific function in relationship to keeping the material energy uh, working in, according to the laws given by Krishna himself. So in that sense, there's where you see the thing. So these demigods are meant to work under the guide, the direction of Indra, and they're his angas, or limbs, just like the cabinet members 
in a particular political situation work under the direction of the, the chief executive. So you might say he, they're his limbs or his parts and parcels, his ungas. So that is used in a, a functionary sense that they work underneath him and they are meant to abide by his direction. And he is in charge and they are supporting his rule by carrying out his instructions by which he is carrying out the instructions of the Supreme Lord. So that's the connection. <clears throat> That's what it means in that sense. It's not like the part and part, like we're part and parcel of Krishna. That's not the same type of mm -hmm, uh, explanation. Mm -hmm, it's slightly different. So the Brahmins are are meant to worship the devas also. So actually. By trying to punish Indra, they will also be acting against their own principles. Mm -hmm. They're not meant to do that. And therefore, Brahma stepped in in order to, you know, settle the, the problem that happened. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? When the incarnations of Krishna appear, sometimes they display some of the opulences, but only when Krishna appears he does he display all six opulences. And that's why when we, when we talk about the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the manifestation of the full nature of God is Krishna. All of the other incarnations of the Lord also have the same power, but they don't display that power. <laughs> That's the point. The Prabhupada was talking today, I was, he was saying that just like Vasudeva expansion of Krishna is just as powerful as Krishna, but he doesn't display that power in his particular incarnation. Like that. But there is another distinction where Krishna himself has four opulences that are not there in any of the incarnations, and that is the opulences of Vrindavan. Surrounded by loving devotees, uh, very unique transcendental pastimes, his beautiful bodily uh, appearance, beautiful bodily form. And there's one more. It's mentioned in the Nectar Devotion. There's four characteristics. Huh? Yeah, and he play, carries a flute, yeah, playing on his flute. These four are unique to Krishna, like that. But the power that the manifestations of the Lord have are given according to what is their mission. And they display only that power related to that mission when they come. But they're all expansions or manifestations of Krishna, and they have the power, the same power of Krishna when they appear. Mm -hmm. Yes. So for us uh, in the West, Maharaj, it's Krishna is the supreme because. We are not from India, so I heard that from Prabhupada books that, that Krishna is the Supreme. Right. So I'm, it's interesting for me, when we were in India, so many people think that Krishna comes from, from Narayan, from, from, um, that yeah. Narayan is the Supreme, and that Krishna comes basically like from, from... Yeah, from Vishnu. From Vishnu, yes. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's the modern day, you know, what they say, encyclopedia compilers. They say Krishna is the 14th incarnation of Vishnu. Because Krishna displayed himself 
Vishnu displays himself as the absolute principle of Godhead in his role. But Krishna, you know, he marries 16,108 queens. He has 10 sons for each queen. He has billions of family members. He plays on the flute. He plays with cows. He teases girls. He jokes around with friends. People cannot put that together <laughs> because they have a poor fund of knowledge. <laughs> Krishna does whatever he wants to do. Vishnu does what he's supposed to do. <laughs> Krishna says, well, I'm God, and whether you like it or not, this is what I do. <laughs> whether you agree or not. So, you know, <laughs> I'm not about to try to satisfy you by doing what you think I should do. <laughs> I'm me. <laughs> so, therefore, we, we, we would sometimes we would say that about, hey, I don't care what you think, I'm doing what I want to do. <laughs> that's, that's Krishna. <laughs> Yeah, he's the Godhead that doesn't care <laughs> what you think, because he's himself. <laughs> but when you get to know him, you find everything about him is wonderful. <laughs> That's the point. <laughs> That's why you find more worshippers of Ram than you do of Krishna, because Ram is a nice guy. <laughs> He kills demons and he has, only has one wife. <laughs> okay, so yeah, people in India, they are also misled about the different manifestations of the Supreme Lord. And who, but the scriptures give the clear, Krishna's two Bhagavan Swayam, Ete cham sam kalom pum sam krishna stu bhano. He's the original Godhead. Uh, what is that verse? Uh, Ishwar of Krishna. Ishwar parma krishna satchit ananda vigraha anadir adir govinda sarva karna karna. Brahma Samhita, spoken by Lord Brahma, establishes he is the original source, he is adir adir. Adi Adir. He is the source and nobody is equal to, nobody is greater than him. He's Adi, Adi Purush. That means he is the original source of all the Purushas, all the incarnations. Like that. Krishna is topmost. But it's hard for people to understand that because of how Krishna displays himself. So what we tell them is, well, if you can't say what Krishna is, then you can't say what Krishna is not. <laughs> if, you can, if you can't say what Krishna is, then you can't say what Krishna is not. Most of the time they say, well, the, you know, God is not like this. Then what is God like? They can't say. <laughs> because God is supposed to fit into their conception. <laughs> Or maybe a little bit beyond, mm -hmm. but that's that's the absolute truth is a chintya, inconceivable. And Jiva Goswami says, unless you accept the the inconceivable nature of God, you cannot understand God. So there's something, there's things about God you'll never understand, <laughs> but you can understand enough where you can develop your love for Him, and that's the most important part. So yeah, there is so many yogis and saints, impersonalists, various schools of spiritual knowledge that teach different aspects of the absolute truths. Some of them, many of them are, are correct, but they teach on a certain level. Just like you might go to school, what's taught in the third grade is one thing, what's taught in the sixth grade is another thing. You can't say because what's not taught in the, in the, in the third grade 
doesn't exist in the sixth grade. <laughs> so people have a certain knowledge up to a certain amount, and certain people teach that level. But then again, there are more and higher and higher teachings until you get to Krishna. <laughs> And so Krishna is the source of the Vishnus, he's the source of the Narayans, he's the source of everything, actually. We worship Narayan in awe and reverence, we worship Krishna in, in a mood of friendship, parental affection, and ultimately Madhurya Ras. So one has to qualify themselves even to begin to understand these relationships, what to speak about entering into them. Hmm. So most people, they're, those who are pious, they worship God as the supreme personality of Godhead who is the, the, the source of all power and all existence. But higher than that is to worship him in these different moods of Vrindavan. Mm -hmm. And that's what, that's what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came to give, Krishna and Vrindavan. Mm -hmm. So unless you, unless you study Lord Chaitanya's teachings and follow the process that he gave, you can't understand Krishna and Vrindavan. It just sounds like some mythology or some nice stories, that's all. Hmm? Lucky. lucky, that's a nice word. <laughs> we're not only lucky, we're maha-lucky. <laughs> yeah, I guess Krishna Vrindavan is, is the ultimate principle of sweetness. <laughs> If you talk about, to some people, because the, the power aspect is somewhat removed from the sweetness aspect, people can't uh, relate to that. They want a God that is all-powerful, who is all-controlling, who is all-everywhere, omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, and then I can worship, then I understand what God is. But if you tell me about a God who steals butter, passes urine on the floor and pulls the tails of monkeys uh, I'm, I'm thinking you know you, you know you're not you, you're not too intelligent <laughs> <laughs> so therefore we don't talk about that because people can't understand they have to qualify themselves by entering into the process given by Lord Chaitanya and then they can gradually reach some understanding like that that's why Bhagavatam starts with the majestic nature of Krishna and ends with the sweet nature of Krishna. You can't bring the sweet nature of Krishna first and then expect people to accept that. You have to say that God is the all-powerful, the controller, the creator, the punisher, like that. And that's what Bhagavatam starts, like that, and then it goes to his different Leela incarnations and finally it comes to his, you know, Vrindavan manifestation. That's in, that comes later on in the Bhagavatam, not at the beginning. Okay. Yes, another question? So one more question. I heard that Haridas Thakur explained the three words of Maha Mantra to refer to Lord Chaitanya and chanted in that way, meditating on Gora Hari. Is this something we can do? Lord Chaitanya does not accept offenses. Can we chant the Hari, the Hari, the Hari Krishna Maha Mantra and meditate on Lord Chaitanya at yes, the same time? Um, yes, it's like, like this, yes. Meditating on Gaura Hari. Yeah, Gaura Hari. <laughs> he is Hari, but he's Gaura. <laughs> he's Golden Hari. Yeah, that's nice. 
Lord Chaitanya and Lord and Krishna are the same. In fact, he is Krishna. In fact, in this age, we worship Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. <laughs> Namo Mahavadanaya Krishna Prema Padayate Krishnaya Krishna Chaitanya Namani Gauda Tristana Maha. So there are many bhaktas who they say, I don't know anything about Krishna, but boy, am I attracted to Lord Chaitanya. <laughs> So there's there's different types of bhaktas. <laughs> but those who meditate on Lord Chaitanya and they're actually meditating on Krishna or Radha Krishna actually. Jai. Okay, so uh, the, the curtains will close in about one minute and 30 seconds. <laughs> so we'll just wait until the Lord disappears. <laughs> but, make sure, but do one thing, don't let him disappear from your heart. <laughs> like that. Okay, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare. Sri Panchatattva Ki Jai, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu Ki Jai, Gaur Bhimanande Hare.